Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, the Royal Society. I'm Humphrey Rang, president of the British Pharmacological Society, which, um, under whose auspices uh, this president's lecture is taking place. It's one of my uh, most enjoyable tasks to uh, uh, identify a good uh, individual to give the President's Lecture and I'm really happy uh, this evening uh, to welcome uh, Patrick Valance who is going to talk uh, a little bit more about uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the way it operates. What's, what's been clear to me really throughout my professional life uh, is how crucial uh, the pharmaceutical industry uh, has been uh, in the development of medicines. 50 years ago, which is when I kind of started out, um, if I imagine now that we were still dealing with the same medicines uh, that we had then, then basically therapeutics would still be uh, in the dark ages. And I think people often forget just how crucial the contributions of the pharmaceutical industry uh, have been uh, to uh, the progress of medicine. Um, Patrick um, trained in medicine at St George's uh, Medical School and uh, worked as a, as, a, as a physician and a clinical pharmacologist, trained in clinical pharmacology uh, at St George's. Um, and uh, in, 2000, in 1996, I think it was, uh, he moved to uh, take the chair of clinical pharmacology at University College London and he became uh, director of the division of medicine uh, at University College London. So he's, he's been, had a really uh, significant and impressive career as an academic uh, clinician. And then in 2006, um, he moved to uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, to be uh, in charge of drug discovery at GlaxoSmithKline. This was a major loss to University College where Patrick had uh, made in really great steps in developing the Division of Medicine into a, into a really impressive unit. Um, it was a loss to University College, uh, but it was uh, really received wide approval uh, from the medical science community that uh, a really eminent practicing physician scientist was going into this highly influential and important position at our largest uh, pharmaceutical company. And uh, since moving to uh, GSK, uh, he's uh, now been promoted a couple of years ago uh, to be head of R and D across the whole country, uh, across the whole uh, company uh, worldwide. So he has enormously important uh, responsibilities. Now, GSK, like all other pharmaceutical companies, uh, is undergoing a lot of facing a lot of challenges at the moment. Really, uh, since 2006, um, and even a bit earlier than that, the uh, revolution in biomedical science, which really stemmed from molecular biology and genomics, uh, was just beginning to take off, and pharmaceutical companies were scratching their heads to decide how to adapt uh, to this change uh, in biomedical science and how to make best use of it uh, to develop uh, new uh, therapies. So that adjustment uh, took quite a lot of companies, not, not by surprise, but certainly caused major upheavals. And at the same time, uh, the economic downturn was about to take off um, and there was increasing uh, pressure on pricing and the business model of the pharmaceutical industry, which again uh, caused uh, substantial upheavals. And as we know in this country, uh, the closure of quite a lot of the major pharmaceutical research uh, centres here. So, and at the same time, the pharmaceutical industry uh, regularly runs into a great deal of, of pretty trenchant uh, criticism 
uh, from many quarters about their pricing policies, their marketing strategies, uh, their transparency in relation to clinical trials data, and so on. So it's certainly been a, a challenging and turbulent time uh, during uh, Patrick's um, tenure of this position. And um, it's really delightful to hear from him uh, that he's, he remains optimistic and um, really encouraged uh, by a lot of uh, things that are going on. So uh, with, without more ado then, well with more ado actually, um, here's the, the, the program uh, for, for uh, this evening. Um, Patrick will give a lecture. Then uh, Sir Michael Rawlins, President of the Royal Society of Medicine and the first uh, head of NICE, this organisation in this country which has made such a difference to um, monitoring of efficacy and cost uh, and on an evidence base uh, in medicine. And uh, Mike Rawlins, uh, who is also a clinical pharmacologist in his earlier days, um, has had a major uh, role. He's laughing at me, I see. <laughs> Are you still? <laughs> yes, OK. Um, and uh, when he's, he's said a few words in response to uh, Patrick's talk, then the chair will be taken over by uh, Julia Buckingham, again, an eminent pharmacologist and now vice chancellor and principal uh, at Brunel University. Um, so there'll be time for questions for the f from the floor and I hope you will all um, think about uh, questions that you might wish to ask these uh, distinguished people. So um, with that, Patrick, I'll invite you to give your talk on um, new medicines, a vital, a vital business for all of us and a, a challenging business as well. Risky. Thank you very much, Humphrey. I um, got somewhat depressed during your introduction, actually, about uh, the turbulent times. But uh, let me say what a great pleasure it is to give this talk, actually. And it's a particular pleasure for a number of reasons. One, because I think the British Pharmacological Society was the first society I joined uh, as a member. And the second is because Humphrey actually taught me when I was an undergraduate and was one of the very reasons I became inspired by pharmacology and in fact has remained an inspiration to me and has given me uh, advice on a number of occasions over the years. So it's a huge pleasure to um, have the opportunity to give his president's lecture. Now, uh, the title is uh, New Medicines of Vital uh, But Risky Business. And what I want to do over the next uh, 40 minutes is to tell you why it's vital and why it's risky, and why literally it's vital, and what some of those risks are. And the risks came to mind today when I was traveling here, and I heard about the risks of trying to land uh, a spaceship on a comet. And I think that many times when you try and make a medicine, you've got the same level of risk and, and uncertainty when you do that. Those risks have trends. Those risks are not totally within the uh, control of the pharmaceutical industry. So there are other players who need to think about the risks and the risks that are imposed. And the reason this is important is because fundamentally, if we don't get that risk bit right, then we run the risk of losing the vital bit. So let's start with um, uh, the question of what the societal contract is between the pharmaceutical industry and society. I mean, in a very simple sense, the license is you make money from making medicines. So we build on the biology and understanding that's in the scientific community, discover and make medicines, make money from those medicines. That money goes back into the company, into R&D, to make money for the next generation and the generation after that. And the problem is that there's a perception that that societal contract has been fractured in some way. That the amount of money taken is disproportionate to the amount of innovation and health benefit for society as a whole. And that is at the root of one of the reputational risks that the industry has. How do you match the amount of money that comes in 
to the future promise, not just for us today, but for future generations. And the question that's come up is, are we, is the industry, a ship which stays in harbour, rather than one that sails and actually takes risk in order to achieve its mission? I'm going to argue that's a wrong perception, but there's no doubt there have been times in the industry's history when the income was disproportionate to the output. And that's a key area that we need to guard against in order to maintain the ability to make medicines. So let's deal with vital to start off with. Is it vital? I think it's self-evidently vital, and Humphrey alluded to this. You've only got to look at some of the things that have happened over the past few decades. The time from the discovery of the HIV virus to making a medicine was unbelievably quick, actually. And the time taken from a new disease to emerge to turn it into a chronic, manageable disease instead of a death sentence was remarkable. The challenge, of course, around that is access to those medicines now. Cancer. The outlook for cancer is dramatically different across a number of different cancers, including increasingly some of the rare cancers, some of the things for which there was no treatment, and also for common cancers, breast cancer. And in some cases, there have been cures, such as in certain types of childhood leukemias many years ago. And reflecting on those advances, the new advances with targeted treatments against mutations, the emerging field of immunomodulation to can for cancer, and then going back to the childhood leukemia cures, it's pretty evident that actually getting medicines out into the use by doctors is part of how you ultimately find out what they can do. So having the ability to use medicines in practice in order to be able to look at combinations, look at rotations, guide clinical practice, do randomized trials in practice, is where we start to learn the full potential of those medicines. And there are many other examples. Multiple sclerosis, a very different outlook now from what it was. Rheumatoid arthritis, treatments which are really spectacular, and it means we're not going to see the sort of deformities that we saw many, many times in the past. I'll take a slightly more benign advance. Alzheimer's disease. There are no really effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. But even the emergence of things that had some effect had a galvanizing effect on, the on medicine. When I trained, Alzheimer's disease was not something that many doctors wanted to get involved with. It was not something that was high profile in the hospital. The emergence of treatments with some effect actually had a triggering effect on the way service was organized, the way research started to occur, and the way patients ultimately benefited. So there's little doubt that the advances of the industry have been vital in all sorts of ways. Now the question then is, well, is the innovation too low? And there's a perception uh, that industry makes Me Too drugs, it copies things. And I thought it was worth just looking at some recent data on this. I'm not sure whether I've got a pointer or not there, but um, the, if you look at pipelines across industry, and ask what's the potential to be first in class. So we need to be a bit careful because uh, there may be five things which have the potential to be first in class, all somewhat neck and neck. But this is what you see, that there's actually a very high percentage of things in pipelines which have the potential to be first in class, but there are often many members of that class. So things are running in parallel. So something that looks like a fifth in class Me Too didn't start as a fifth in class Me Too necessarily. It might have actually been the front runner at the beginning and it ends up fifth at the end. And that's an issue of competition, which I want to come back to in a minute. The other thing to point out there is I'm, I'm gratified, and I'll, I'll come back to this several times, that neuroscience is picking up. And I'll try and explain a little bit why we have trends across these areas. Look at this from a different angle and you go much earlier and you say, well, what about the targets people work on? This is data from a group at GSK that was put together. So this is asking the question, of the targets you're trying to make a medicine against, how many are being worked on by multiple companies? So we're now a bit earlier in the pipeline. 
So on the left is the overall figures, and in the blue, it means that only one company is working on it. And so this is, it's a bit difficult to go very, very early. So this is things in the public domain that you can see. And uh, it looks like 42% of, of all targets, only one company is working on. 26%, five plus companies are working on. And if you look on the right-hand side, it's divided into those targets which are proven, i.e. there is a drug already in, on the market or one that's in late phase three that you know works. And you can see where it's a proven target, there's definitely the case that people jump on it. So 64% now, you've got more than five companies working on it. So once you know something works, you do see people jumping on it. If it's truly novel, i.e. we don't know that it works yet, then you can see there's a much higher proportion of only one company working on a target. So it's, it's actually not correct that there's lots of copying going on at the early stage. There's definitely some bandwagon jumping, but there's an awful lot where companies are taking a lot of risk early in terms of target selection. So there is innovation, there is risk taking at the beginning of the process in lots of companies. So let's deal with the risks. And I've divided them, I'm sure there are many more than this, but I've divided them into some broad categories, science, financial, society, and personal. And I want to start with financial risk. The money that's invested, and the money that's invested is, of course, because most companies are publicly traded, is our money, one form or another. It's pensions and other things that go into these uh, funds that buy stock of companies, and so most of us have some interest one way or another through funds that we either own or other people are investing on our behalf, like our pensions. And they go into the company and they want a return on that money. So what's happened? Well, there are a number of things which make the financial risk higher than it was. First, the blockbuster model is unsustainable. And much of the industry growth came from individual blockbusters. I think it still will in a way. However, what's wrong and what became apparent was wrong is just because you're selling a massive amount of drug in one particular class, it doesn't mean you can in invent another one in that class. So the idea that you set out to make a replacement blockbuster is fundamentally flawed, and I think that's seen. You can't predict where you're going to get. So the notion of following on in an area with a blockbuster is highly fraught and highly likely to fail. Drugs won't be reimbursed if they're not sufficiently differentiated. I think that's appropriate. I think that's what we would think as, as, as payers of taxes or uh, people who've got healthcare policies. You wouldn't want the drug that's not differentiated to necessarily get reimbursed. There are higher regulatory risks post-launch, very often after the launch of a medicine, although I've already said you learn a lot about your medicine post-launch, there are very substantial regulatory hurdles that are put in place, including massive outcome studies, which add a lot to the cost of a medicines. Patent life is shrinking in the sense of usable patent life. So the patent may be 25 years, but the time getting to approval is longer, and therefore the usable patent life is shrinking, and you know, making the medicine, physically making it, is usually not difficult. Not always, but usually not that difficult. So the process of manufacturing is relatively straightforward once you've got it. So the moment your patent goes, your price drops 95%. And it's interesting to me that makers of generics somehow have got a good reputation they invest nothing back in innovation in terms of the next generation. And there's a sort of societal interesting issue there as to what we really want to pay for our drugs. And pricing reflects both innovation and differentiation, and there are macroeconomic pressures, and, and, and Humphrey mentioned some of them. There have been downtime, downturns in economies across the world. There have been pricing pressures across the world. So there's a big financial risk. And just to put it in some context, this is the inverse of Moore's law as to what's happened in the pharmaceutical industry. So this is the number of drugs on a log scale per billion US dollars against time. So it's a rather unedifying gra graph, actually, to show that we're getting progressively less able to make a medicine for an inflation-adjusted cost. So the industry apparently has become less efficient Despite the fact that if you look at many of the things along the bottom, high throughput screening, 
ability to do things at scale, efficiencies have been put into the industry. But of course, what's missing here is the fact that many of the failures are actually fundamentally science failures of not really knowing how to do what we're going to do. So you can put lots of efficiencies in the system, but there's a scientific judgment which needs to be in there to know what to do. And the big failures occur when you get to the clinical trials and things don't work, and the big costs occur when you get to the clinical trials and things don't work. So there's a decline in productivity and an increase in cost per successful medicine, something like $1.2 billion per successful medicine that comes out on average. Why? Because it takes into account the failures as well, and the failure rate is too high. The chances of succeeding from the beginning are something well under 5%. So it's, it's a risky business, it's an expensive business, and there's financial risk in terms of investment. Now, one of the questions you're going to ask is, well, who pays for this if this is the cost going up? And you may want to uh, look at another graph as to whether it's us that's paying through the NHS. And, and the answer is no, actually. So if you look at the uh, expenditure per person, so the total NHS expenditure per person is in the blue line, and the NHS expenditure per medicines is in the red line. So actually, the increased healthcare costs are not driven largely by medicines, at least in the NHS, no doubt in part to, uh, to the work of NICE and others. But this is an interesting uh, difference from, I think, how people perceive it, and of course rather topical today with the um, uh, news of the Cancer Drugs Fund and how that's going to operate. So let's come back to the risks. I've dealt with financial. What I'd like to do is talk about science risk. And of course, the science risk fundamentally underpins the financial risk, because if the science risk were lower, then uh, the financial risk would also be very much lower. And some of those things that I said you must do in order to get a medicine out, you could do more easily. The worst possible thing you can do in drug discovery and development is to make a medicine all the way to the end that nobody wants to buy because you sink all of your cost and you get none of your return. So failing early is critically important and understanding what differentiation looks like is critically important. So what are the key decisions that we have to make? And there aren't very many key decisions actually. The first and the most obvious is what are we going to target? What are we going to make the medicine against and why would we do that? The second is which medicine do we make? Which physical product do we make? Small molecule, big molecule, antisense, gene therapy. Which molecule are we going to pick in a class or indeed precisely which molecule? And once you pick that molecule, you have locked and loaded all of the promise and all of the risk. The next is, how do we know this does something in humans? How do you actually understand that you're on track to have a therapeutic effect? And what is the dose? And dose is often misunderstood as a key factor in this. Now, I'm speaking to a room of the British Pharmacological Society who know exactly that dose is important. And I was brought up rather dogmatically by somebody who trained me saying that the... Not Humphrey. Um, saying, <laughs> saying, saying, that, uh, saying, saying that the difference between a physiologist and a pharmacologist was a physiologist only ever used one dose. And we know dose-response curves are important. But dose-response curves are critically important. Many, many, many drugs fail in development because the dose is wrong, and in the clinic often for safety because the dose is wrong. And then, if we get that far, how do we test the true risk and benefit in phase three studies? How do we really demonstrate the effect of this medicine in big populations? And finally, how do we demonstrate in the real world that this has value to the patients and to the healthcare systems? Those are the decisions. And I want to give three examples of differences in risk profile when you look at this. So example number one, would be an historic view, and I'm saying historic because I think things are changing, of a medicine for depression. What is the target you're going to go after? Well, you're either going to go after the monoamine pathways that you know are related to depression, or frankly, you were almost guessing. It's in the brain. We didn't know where to start. Okay, so we'll choose something and go for it. 
Can we make the medicine? Yes, you can absolutely make the medicine. So we should be able to make the physical product and make the medicine for that, because that's what industry is really good at. How do we know it does something? Well, the animal models are unlikely to help us very much. We don't have good animal models of depression, so we're unlikely to get very much information from that. The small clinical studies are likely to be quite misleading because we don't have very sophisticated ways of diagnosing, selecting patients, and knowing exactly what we should measure. So we may get through that. And we're going to know the drug is safe, at least in small populations. So by now, we've spent a lot of money. We still don't know whether we're anywhere close to being right. And we've optimized a molecule, and perhaps we know the molecule gets into the brain. So we're going to go into phase three. In phase three, it's very common in depression studies to use a placebo and a positive control of an existing antidepressant. The positive control fails 50% of the time. So let's assume you're right. You, you know, all of these things are right. You've got your new medicine in the clinic. 50% of the time, you'll appear wrong. It's a massively high-risk proposition for drug discovery and development. Take another example, and cancer would be one, but I'm going to use a rare disease, where you have a genetic basis for your disease. You know precisely what the target is, you know exactly what's causal, and you have the same thing in some types of cancer with driver mutations. So you've started from a very different position. You can diagnose the patients with 100% accuracy. You know exactly who's got the disease and who hasn't. And you should be able to measure something relevant to that disease because the phenotype is so well described related to the genotype. So here, you can start knowing what the target is, knowing what the population is, knowing what you're going to measure. You're looking for big effect sizes, and you've got a willing regulatory and payer environment to help you. That's a very different proposition for drug discovery and development than the first one. The third example I want to give is antibiotics. We know what to target very often, or we think we know, some uh, essential gene in the bug. Can we make the medicine? Yes. But bugs are very, very good at living in hostile chemical environments, so they're going to kick that medicine out. So you're going to make a very, very big dose. When you make a very big dose, you immediately run the risk of side effects, and that's why a lot of antibiotic programs fail, and in fact the failure rate, rate for antibiotics is higher than for other classes. Surprising, because you know what the target is, but it's the dose you need to give which kills most antibiotics in development. Do we know how to test it? Yes, we do, but actually the test is not can you kill the bug in humans, it's can you treat pneumonia, can you treat urinary tract infection, can you do each different organ system. Very expensive development path. At the end of it, if you get through, you have a medicine which is curative of a disease which is lethal sometimes, or was lethal in the pre-antibiotic era. We value these medicines very much less than we value a cancer medicine, and therefore there's a market problem. And in fact, when you've got the antibiotic, many of us would say, don't use it, we'll save it for when I really need it. So there we've got a very different set of problems to try and face in terms of risk. That's why things are unequal. If you look across pipelines, what you see is masses of medicines. So there are 7,450 compounds in pipelines across therapeutic areas. Most of them are in oncology and immunomodulation, the vast majority. Most of the anti-effectives there you'll find are actually antivirals and things, not antibiotics as such, and you can see the distribution. Science is unequal. Opportunity is unequal. Risk is unequal. And therefore, you end up with very skewed pipelines across industry, depending on what the scientific opportunity is. This unequal distribution of medicines is also true if you start looking at where public funding goes. So this is a plot from uh, National Cancer Research Institute. You can do it across lots of therapy areas, telling you there's a lot of money, so the bigger the, the uh, purple area, the, the bigger the amount of money. A lot of money spent on biology understanding in cancer and etiology, a bit less in prevention, quite a lot less, some in early detection and uh, diagnosis and, and prognosis, a lot in treatment and so on. So it's, it's actually got a lot of investment across the patch in public money in terms of cancer. 
If you put up a, a distribution like that for uh, some other areas, you'd find there's masses of biology and there's no clinical experimentation. My rare disease example again, when you're in the clinic, there are clinician scientists specializing in these disease who know exactly how to measure things in those patients. If you haven't got clinical scientists in the area that you're in, you're at a disadvantage. If you don't know what to measure when you get into the clinic, you're flying blind. So the distribution of public money is actually critically important. It's not possible to discover a medicine if you don't understand something about the targets. It's not possible if you don't understand something about what you're going to measure in the clinic. So there is a very important link, and I think this is a key thing nationally and internationally, between what you choose to invest in, which areas you choose to stimulate science in, in order to create a productive environment in which you can discover and develop medicines. Antibiotics. Actually, industry takes a lot of the blame. Why has industry got out of antibiotic research? And it's true, there were something like 19 big companies working in antibiotics in the 19, beginning of the 1990s, and there was something like four now. So it's undoubtedly true that big companies have reduced their investment and got out of antibiotic research. We're still in it, and, and some others are. But it's also true that there isn't much public funding in the areas relevant to trying to make medicine. So which targets do you go after? How can you really think about different ways of disrupting bacterial behaviours in order to get here? So there's a link between these, these investments which is important, and I've illustrated the issues around antibiotic drug discovery and development more generally. Dementias. Um, it's an interesting thing that, you know, things I read before I joined industry and thought they made sense make much less sense when I look at it now um, from, from inside. And one of the things you sometimes read is that Alzheimer's disease doesn't have lots of pharmaceutical interest because of market failure. It's completely untrue. I don't need, however um, clever and well-informed my commercial colleagues are, I don't need them to tell me that if I can cure Alzheimer's, we can make a lot of money. I'm very, very well aware of that. I just don't know how to do it. It's a scientific problem. It's not a market failure. Successful medicines in, 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 for Alzheimer's would have a very, very substantial market if you knew where to do it, where to, make, where to make them, what to measure, how to diagnose the patients, how to phenotype them accurately, how to measure the right things rather than the easy things or the conventional things. And these are critical areas where I think the increase in public awareness, the increase in science funding, and the rather targeted science funding that people are thinking about with everything from etiology through to measurements is the right way to rekindle the possibility of making medicines in this area. I don't think the answer is to shut lots of things in the clinic at the moment. We don't know how to do that. We need to get the basics right in order to know how to make a medicine. So I think some of the funding in the UK, the Dementias Platform UK and other things are going to be really important in how we think about um, uh, getting traction. So what are some of the things that create optimism around how you can go about doing this? Well, there are all sorts of technologies that start helping you, you know, where, see where medicines go, understanding better the distribution of medicines in, 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 the, in, in the body and in cells, and these are going to be important. But I want, to, I want to really come back to this beginning. Our retrospective analysis, and I think others have got the same experience, shows that if you have some degree, virtually any degree, of genetic association with your target, retrospectively, we were nine times more likely to be successful in phase three and roughly twice as likely to be successful from the beginning. Well, if your success rate from the beginning is 1%, moving that to 2% is pretty good. It makes a huge difference in the, um, uh, in the economics of the whole industry. So the advances in human genetics, which isn't the answer to every drug target for sure, there are many outside that, but the advances 
in true human genetics, true associations, are going to make a radical difference to the success rate of the industry. The complexity is that there are three new genetic mutations every week associated with rare diseases identified, and there are 15 new associations with common disease every week. You cannot possibly keep on top of this information, you cannot possibly digest it, and you cannot possibly think about how to use it in a logical way. Which is why we and others have done similar things. We've teamed up with the European Bioinformatics Institute and the Sanger Centre to form an integrated centre to try and make up-to-date maps of the information, not to tell somebody where to start on drug discovery, because a lot comes down to judgment, and we're organized in small groups that can really make those judgments with great scientists leading them. But to say, if you're on that pathway, actually in the some genetic association, you probably would go there preferentially. So that information from that uh, unit becomes public. We don't keep it to ourselves. I don't believe that target identification per se is a competitive advantage. I believe the medicine we make against it's important. And I think being smart about what you choose to work on from that target information is important. The second area, just to mention, which is a different model, which I think we don't yet know whether this is successful in true outcomes, but if it is, I think it has quite big implications, is what we did in our Disease of the Developing World unit in just outside Madrid, where we work on malaria, we work on TB, and we work on leishmaniasis. We were struggling to make real progress in malaria, and the group there did a whole cell screen, so they took malaria parasites in red cells and they screened, and that's a very difficult screen to do, looking for killing of the malarial parasites, and they found 13,000 compounds in our collection of over one point something million killed the bug. We were going to sort of work through and pick the ones we liked and worked on them, and we had a different idea. So why don't we just put all of that in the public domain? Getting a drug for malaria is a massive societal issue. Why don't we just put that in the public domain? And why don't we ask that others that use it put their information in the public domain? And why don't we set up a lab next to our lab where scientists can come and work and work with us, which we called the Open Lab and we created a foundation. Now there are 75 projects worldwide using that screening collection. There are things that have come out of it that we'd never have thought of. There are groupings of chemicals that we wouldn't have thought of grouping in the way that other people have. So it's a very open innovation model to malaria treatment. Why can we do it in malaria? Because we're never going to make any money from malaria. This is part of the, uh, I think, duty of a company to work in these areas. And we can do it knowing that if we're successful, great but we would never have made money from it. But the challenge I think this throws up is if this is a more successful way to tackle really difficult problems, if, why wouldn't you ask why you don't do that for other diseases? And if you do that, what's the business model you wrap around it? So I think lots of ifs in there, and we don't know the answers, but an experiment which is underway at the moment, and one which actually is very exciting and I think has rejuvenated over the last few years our um, discovery effort in these difficult areas. So those are the challenges, and there are lots of changes. Targets are becoming more validated. Human target validation is key. It's going to change the outlook, and it is changing the outlook across industry. Making the medicine, we know more about the relationship between chemotype and toxicity, but we don't know enough. There are opportunities, I believe, to share across industry. There is a dearth of high quality academic toxicology, which is a problem for the industry. It's something that needs to be looked at. It's something that's important, I think, for the industry. At the moment, most safety relating to small molecules is a dialogue between us and the regulators. We need a third party of strong academic presence, really modernizing safety science and toxicology. One of the issues that didn't come up when the AstraZeneca-Pfizer um, courtship is not the right word, I'm not quite sure what it was, but, uh, but was being, being uh, uh, discussed widely, is the training of medicinal chemists in this country. Medicinal chemists are trained in big companies and then feed small companies. If there's only one company in the UK 
Unfortunately, there isn't. There are two. But if there were only one, that's a very difficult training proposition. It's something to be concerned about. So small molecules, and I've said all of us have gone way beyond small molecules now. Most companies will have biopharmaceuticals, will have antisense, may have siRNA, will have gene therapies. Experimental medicine is improving. Technologies, wearable technologies, continuous monitoring, those sorts of things are changing. I think the early stage trials, that's going to be a very important way of de-risking. Um, clinical trials in the phase three sense, the operations of those clinical trials is much too fragmented across industry. Much of what we do is identical. So there are ways, and there are, there's, a, there's a company being set up called Transcelerate between many major pharmaceutical companies to say, the way we actually operationalize clinical trials across the globe isn't a competitive advantage. Let's do more of that together. I'll come back to the how do we demonstrate it has value in just a minute. So let me move now to the final section on society and personal risks. And I want to change to a different area. Ebola is clearly a massive, massive problem at the moment. It's a massive societal problem, and one which, frankly, has two major approaches. One is the one of making sure that basic medical care, hygiene, and so on is properly looked after, and the second is intervention. And that absolutely requires the pharmaceutical industry, vaccines in particular, but other approaches as well. There's no question, to come back to the vital word, that the industry is essential in this. It's interesting, though, that if you read some of the things, you'd think that the profit motive for pharma had stopped us being involved in this. Well, the vaccine that we've now got into humans and are trying to fast track from a process that normally takes many, many years to try and get it out before this epidemic has run its course to try and help with this epidemic was in the company. I mean, it wasn't that we suddenly thought in March, let's make a vaccine for Ebola. We had a vaccine. So it's not true, actually, that industry had ignored this problem. It is interesting to ask a different question, though, which is how much of the publicly funded money went to look into Ebola research? Very little. NIH did quite a lot, and actually the NIH was absolutely instrumental in the vaccine, but rather little. So this is a societal issue of where we choose to put our resources, as well as one for the industry alone. Let me deal with a few other things. Animal research, I've emphasised the importance of human target validation. I feel absolutely passionately that's the way that we need to go. We need to base it far more on human data. But animal experiments remain central to what we do. I don't believe anyone in this room would agree to have a new chemical entity injected into them for the first time that hadn't been into an animal. I don't believe anyone in society would be prepared to do that. Animal experiments remain central. There needs to be the right debate about animal experimentation. It needs to be something that is accepted as part of how we treat diseases. Stratified medicines, i.e. trying to get more bespoke about who you treat with which medicines, is of course important. It reduces risk and increases benefit for the individual. But this isn't going to happen effectively in practice without investment in other things. So if you take what's happening in cancer at the moment, remarkable advances in the way one thinks about mutations in cancer cells, circulating DNA detection, ability to target your medicine against patients, it's useless if we don't have the infrastructure in the health service in order to support that. So there's a risk there that things get out of kilter in terms of what you can do and what you're actually able to implement. And there's another risk, which is that most stratified medicines are not binary. They don't work or not work. They work better in some people than others. And there there becomes interesting questions about who should be giving the medicine and where do you place that cutoff. Use of data, I've alluded to, it's critically important for analysis of medicines in the real world. It's critically important for understanding disease epidemiology. It's critically important for health services to sort out how they operate. And you will know that there is a huge problem about the issue of who owns what and confidentiality and the number of letters you read in the papers saying, you know, don't let big pharma get their hands on the data of patients in the NHS. The argument is bizarre. This is not about individually identifiable data. 
It's about using data to understand performance of medicines and understanding how you can make new medicines. It's a big issue. It's a legitimate one that society should discuss. It may be resolved by something much simpler, which is to say we own our data and then we choose to give it back rather than have governments own it and give it to somebody else. But that's a big area. And how you mine that data is critically important. And I want to end by talking about technology and cures. And the reason I put them under sort of a risk thing is there are new technologies coming along. People are taking risks on new technologies. There are risks associated with new technologies, not least how do you assess safety in new technologies? Quite a difficult problem. I've already alluded to the difficulty in safety science generally, even more difficult when you get into new things. We've got a treatment for a, a very rare disease, an immunodeficiency, called ADA SCID. Our phase three trial has been completed. So this is taking cells out from these children, inserting the gene, reinserting the cells. Those cells populate the bone marrow. And this looks like an effective thing from the phase three data. You know, we've got to go through the regulatory process. We'll see where we get to. But this is the type of thing that's coming along now. That comes with all sorts of complexities in terms of how you actually turn that into a product. It also comes with complexities in terms of how you think about monitoring safety. We're also exploring this area of something not very pharmacological in some senses, which is implantable electronic devices to think about managing circuitry, to think about um, uh, altering uh, electrically excitable cells as a way to change the way we think about therapies. That's very high risk. That's many, many years off, but it's the sort of thing that actually may be important in the future. And then finally, cures. How many cures has the industry actually made? Well, antibiotics definitely cure. Some cancer drugs cure some cancers, and that's it. That is the entire history of cures in the pharmaceutical industry. Everything else is symptomatic, palliative, you know, important, as I've said at the beginning, but not cures. HIV treatments are not cures. This is the latest cure, which is the drug from Gilead, which is the hep C drug. I think many people were trying to get there. They got there first. Um, and that is a cure. It cures hepatitis C, and it's very expensive. I think we're on the wave of a new lot of cures for a variety of reasons, including the technologies. It's going to be challenging in terms of thinking about price, and it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves in terms of how much risk people are prepared to take to get there. And you can see some of the... Uh, conundrums that have been laid out there in some of those articles. So let me end by saying what will increase success? What will reduce risk? There's little doubt in my mind that the massive advances in human biology, human genetics are having a big impact on the fundamental risk, which is where the hell do we start? The target identification. There's little doubt that some of the new approaches to how we actually target those targets, i.e. the medicines we make, is changing in a way that's going to reduce and change risk. I've talked about some of them, gene therapy. One can think we know already about biopharmaceuticals and the very different risk profile they have compared to um, small molecules. These are changing success rates, but they're expensive and they carry still the big financial risk. There are definitely changes in some of the regulatory processes, some good, some bad, and we'll see where they end up. And at the moment, there is a big downward pressure on price in the US, and the US basically funds the industry. Pricing in the US is largely what drives much of the industry. So there are some things there to watch out for, and I want to end by talking about success in the UK. We are unbelievably well-placed in terms of world-class academia. We're unbelievably well-placed still in terms of over-representation of big pharma. We remain relatively weak in the biotech sector, which I think is a problem because many of these things evolve in an ecosystem which is important. So we need to still keep thinking about investment in stimulating biotech. We've got much better about movement of people between sectors, I think we need to be considerably better than we are. I think we need to be much more fluid between academia, big companies, small companies, 
it's where, if, where you see that working well, you see an environment which stimulates new things. I think we've got to work on that. I think we've got a few areas where we're clearly at the lead. I think stem cell therapy, we ought to be getting there at the front. In cell-based therapies generally, we ought to be getting towards the front of. But there are some things that need to be done, including some of those I've alluded to in terms of training capabilities and also access to data. So this is vital. It is absolutely central to the UK economy. It's central to the UK health. And I believe it's central to the science uh, base we have here. It's risky. Those risks are exciting and they are potentially inhibitory if we don't manage them appropriately. I hope I've managed to outline some of them for you tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. Patrick, um, as I expected, that was, of course, a fantastic lecture, as your lectures always are. And I don't think any of us can be in any doubt of the vitality or the vitalness of pharma. I suspect we weren't before we started, but I think you've done a great um, job in making a good case for it. But my God, it's risky and it's difficult. Now, before we open the floor to discussion, I'm going to hand over now to Michael Rawlings, a very distinguished clinical pharmacologist who I'm sure you will all know, who is going to... Um, respond to Patrick and I think ask a couple of questions to get the discussion going. Just like old times. <laughs> Brilliant, and you, there's no less than what you'd expect from a clinical pharmacologist, and I still regard myself, despite what the president said at the beginning, as a clinical pharmacologist. Uh, I, I think I'll forgive him uh, by the end of the evening, but uh, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, and, and of course, you, you know, you heard uh, uh, a wonderful exposition uh, from somebody who's had a distinguished career in academia and a distinguished career uh, uh, discovering and developing new medicines. And as Patrick knows, because we've talked about this before, I'm very worried about the sustainability of the current development paradigm. Discovery, I don't know anything about, you know, I'm a clinical pharmacologist, but the development bit. And what worries me is this. I don't know how much it costs to produce a new product, but, you know, 1.2 billion, some people sometimes say 2 billion, sometimes say 3. I guess it varies with the drug, actually. Um, but, but as we fragment diseases, as we discover that schizophrenia is 20 different diseases, as we know that breast cancer is 10 different diseases, the idea that we can spend this amount of money uh, to, to, to um, on 10% on of cancer or 5% of schizophrenia, I don't think it's going to work. And, and so I think it beholds all of us uh, uh, to try and see ways in which we can make development quicker, because if you have a longer period of, uh, of sales, that's better, uh, uh, and less expensive. Uh, I understand, for example, that the, the, uh, uh, a third of the cost of, of a clinical trial, uh, by quintiles anyway, is spent on contact monitoring. Clinical researcher says it's going around site to site every month uh, making sure all the boxes are ticked. Now, you know, God, there's a better way of doing it. And so, Patrick, you... you, you well, so I completely agree. And I think on that last point, I mean, um, risk-based monitoring is the way to do that. Yeah. So you, you look at trends from sites centrally, and you fly people out to visit rather than do the old-fashioned way of people going out to every site and sort of ticking boxes yeah. or doing a, a random audit. So I think there are technology solutions which are coming in. Yeah. I think, though, that the other side to it is, is the, just the operational side of this, which is replicated across industry, which I alluded to. So if you go into a site which runs a lot of clinical trials, there will be 10 laptops open. One for GSK study, one for Sanofi, one for Pfizer, one for AZ. And there will be 10 different systems. Those will be audited by 10 different companies. The tr people will be trained by 10 different companies, all basically to do the same thing, which is run a clinical trial. So there are ways in which you can absolutely have standardised agreed training. That's what Transcelerate is set up to do, to say, we all buy into the fact, if Sanofi have audited this site, we're OK with it. Yeah. If uh, we have one common portal that you can go through to do clinical trials, you don't have to have 10 laptops. You can do it once. So I think there are simple things like that. But then there are 
also ways of reducing the size of studies, helping things fail quickly, yep, yep, yep. Uh, increased use of Bayesian things early to try and get to decision points. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that need to happen. It's a very slow process, yeah. as, as you know. Yeah. And there is conservatism inside industry and in regulators. And the yep. frustrating thing is I speak to the head of the FDA, or the head of the EMEA, or you, or somebody, we all agree. We want to be innovative. <laughs> but we've got to do something. And then you go down the organization and you have a rather conservative group speaks to a conservative group of regulators. Ooh, haven't seen that before. I don't think you should do that. My conservative group come back and say, we were right. We've got to be very cautious here. We should do exactly what we did last time. Yeah. And so it is a very, you know, we've got to. We've got to break this. It's we've the got to biggest break this. economic bottleneck yep. at the moment yep. is clinical development. Yep. yep. Well, that was my. Uh, I mean, I've got lots of other questions, but it's not fair on the rest of you. Right, OK. Well, thank you very much, Michael. So, come on, everybody. It is your turn now um, to challenge Patrick. Um... OK. Can you, can you say who you are? And you, you may need to shout. We have got microphones, actually, but I'm not sure how well people from behind can hear if we don't use them. My name is Tom McDonald, and I'm a clinical pharmacologist <laughs> in Scotland. Um, and I think that the NHS is a fantastic place in which to do large clinical trials because we've got the system for capturing the prescribing, the dispensing, the hospitalizations, the GP visits, it's all there. And lots of pundits in the, you know, sort of politicians have said, what a great place, why don't we do research within the NHS? And yet it doesn't happen. We could easily randomize people within the NHS, <laughs> yeah. NHS even if you cluster randomize people within practices. What do you think the barriers are to this? Well, so oncology has been better than other areas at doing it, as you know. We're running a, a study in the NHS in Salford exactly to do that. In fact, it's randomised cluster of, of practices, uh, which is the first time that's been done with a pre-approval pre medicine. Um, it's been incredibly slow to even get that off the ground. And what was interesting was, and very frustrating, was, um, and so, the reason we did it in Salford is they've got linked primary and secondary um, databases, the number of general practitioners who said our job is absolutely not to help industry, it's our job to protect our patients against industry. <coughs> That's a big, you know, you, you're not going to get, now we've got overcome that, we're running the study, it's a big experiment as to how we do it, but it has been an uphill struggle to get that going. And that's true, of course, <laughs> if you look at the statistics for study time startup, patient enrolment, all those things for the UK, and every company has them, we're not top of the league by any means. So theoretically, what you say is totally right, and I'm pushing at the moment on could we run an entire study in the NHS by the NHS with a new economic model attached to it. But if that's going to work, we have to be much, much better at getting patients into trials and doing them professionally. OK, any more questions? One down there, right next to the microphone. <coughs> David Fox, RSC. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you for championing the cause of medicinal chemists in a BPS meeting, so much appreciated. Um, my question is about um, the target validate, validation, and you uh, made a strong case for why target ID should be shared and made more open, and in fact, then went on to say how important it is then to choose the right target. And yet we're still in an environment where that selection of the target is still not pre-competitive. You showed around 50% of innovation projects being um, pursued by more than one company. So my question is, how risky does the business need to become before target validation, confidence in target, will become pre-competitive? Well, mo most targets are public. I mean, most targets are discovered in academia. <coughs> And the reason we've gone down the route we have, which will all become public, is we want to use the public information to try and organise it in a way that's easier to access and more reliable in order to get target information. So that will all be public. How you then choose, of course, is not public. I mean, that has to be something you, you make a decision on yourself. But the competition, and I meant to say this on this slide, so I'll take the opportunity now, when we see five companies all working on the same targets, I think that's normal human behaviour. And I don't think anywhere in academia, apart from the occasional Nobel Prize winner, do we see one group working on something. I mean, mostly, most papers that come out, you're first, you're first by two weeks. You're not first by 10 years, mostly. And so, I, and most grants we see, 
you know, you know there's another grant pretty similar gone in somewhere else. So I think this notion of, of you know, that, that, that this is lazy to be working on the same things is wrong. I think it's, it's normal, and I think it, it, it's probably appropriate there's a level of overlap between these things. Yes, Tom. Uh, Tom Blackman. Uh, Patrick, you've been a champion of, you know, the transition from big pharma into academia over the years. How successful has that been when, within academia, we're still seeing a, a very rigid departmental yeah. system and no interdisciplinary groups? It, it, is, it is much better than it was, I think, um, but it's still hard work. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I will plead totally guilty to this. When I was head of medicine at UCL, if I was looking at two CVs and one of them came with a load of to somebody to, to get as a senior lecturer or whatever, and somebody came with a string of nature papers and somebody came from uh, 10 years in the industry and told me they were very good, I knew who I was going to go for. And I think, therefore, there are two bits to that. One is in industry, we need to publish more. So you've got some credibility in that world, which I think is important. But I think there needs to be a flexibility about what constitutes real scientific experience and excellence, which is not yet there. Um, and I also think from the other way around, academia into industry, the worry is, and the, the people I'd like to attract now, and we are, we're doing it, but it's slow and we're you know, variably successful, is up and coming superstars who want to come and spend five years in industry. They might spend the rest of their careers in industry, but let's say five years to really try and work with us to tackle a problem. And they should then, I think, go back to academia, most of them, with a very different skill set, a very different notion of interdisciplinary research, a very different notion of how you apply multiple technologies to, to um, um, address problems. I think if we could get half a dozen people like that back into very senior positions in UK academia, it would really change the, the atmosphere. But it's not easy, because that's a very vulnerable part of your career, of course, when you do that, when you're making your name. Patrick, how do you think we can take that forward? Because certainly from what I do now, I mix with a lot of engineers, and engineers are definitely different. But they are extremely good at getting that interface yeah. between industry and Much academia. So, so what can we do as academics um, to help facilitate that. Well, I, I, I do think in, in that specific example I've just given, I think it needs probably you know, three or four really top universities to say we're prepared to do that and to identify individuals who they think are of the right type and say, I'm going to hold your hand through this. Yeah. So you, you, know, you can go mm. and I'm holding it so when you, you can come back. There needs to be some return route. Yeah. But it's also a culture shift, isn't it? I mean, it's getting, it's getting younger people thinking that part of their career will be yeah. in industry. And I think, there but will I think be that, that interplay. That would do it with we role models. We don't start it earlier enough. We don't start it early enough, and then you don't have role models. Yeah, absolutely. But Patrick, do you think one of the, also one of the inhibitors is this dreadful sort of Edwardian belief that trade is somewhat something a gentleman shouldn't do? Or, or do you think that's gone? <laughs> Oh, I think there, there definitely is, and it's more prevalent here. I mean, you go to, you know, you go to you know, Boston and Cambridge, yeah, US, yeah. And, and people are in and out yeah, the, yeah, the whole yeah, time. Yeah. I mean, there's absolutely no fear of that. Yeah, there is definitely yeah. still a feeling that if you come into industry, you don't quite make it. Yep. You know, you're back in, you're, you're, or you start up a company and something fails, yep. which most likely it will. Coming back into academia, why would I have somebody who's sort of gone to try and make uh, filthy lucre and uh, failed and, and I'm not having them back? So I think there's definitely a prejudice. Yeah, and, and certainly in my experience, the, the dream of American academics is both a Nobel Prize and selling your startup company for $100 million. You're not, meet some of them have you're done not it. meeting the ambitious ones. <laughs> 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 right, there, there are two questions there what, one just there and one there. You're going to have to put your hands up higher, I think. Thank you very much. I'm Tim Fennell. I was a BPS AJ Clark Scholar, and I had a fantastic training in pharmacology by many people in this room. But I want to ask a bit of a contrary question, especially as the future of therapy, as you alluded to, and many of the biotechs and pharmaceutical industries are moving to gene therapies, cell therapies, and implantable devices, which don't abide by the typical rules of pharmacology. Is the era of the pharmacologist over? Mm. Well, um, there's definitely been a, a lot of discussion. Is the era of small molecule um, uh, pharmacology over in terms of industry? Uh, it's not. I mean, you can see it's not, actually. In fact, 
five years ago, I'd say lots of people saying, oh, it's all going to be biopharmaceuticals and things. There's a resurgence, actually, in small molecule interest. So I don't think that's the case. I think there will be a broadening of other approaches. Now, your question is about pharmacologists, and I think it's key. Integrative science is key to this. And so the pharmacologist is central to this. And we, have a, we do have a disappearance of pharmacologists. Um, I've talked about other disciplines. Pharmacology is also hard to come by. One of the things that we've done is moved away from something that was prevalent in the 1990s, which is the answer to the problem is let's have a big chemistry line, a big biology line, a big DMPK metabolism line, let's a uh, clinical line, and the whole thing becomes a process. You put something in at the beginning, you do your high throughput screen, out it comes and so on. We reintegrated into teams, very quite small teams, 50 or 60 people with the skill sets in those teams, of which then pharmacology becomes central because it's around testing the pharmacodynamic effect, it's about understanding the behaviour of the molecules, and that, that skill I think is difficult to come by now. But it's not the same as it was. So I'd, I'm not looking for lots and lots of animal pharmacologists now because there's a trend towards much more human target validation. If I'm doing gene therapy on things, I do need pharmacology because what's going to let that down? It's going to be things like dose, dose response, understanding effect. Biopharmaceuticals go in currently at a big dose. Dose response relationships for biopharmaceuticals is an extremely unusual skill set to have, and it's probably the, one of the most important things that we can get right in that area. Okay, now we've got time for one last question, which is right at the very back, and then we can continue with this after a little aside um, over drinks. A bit of pharmacology. <laughs> a practical pharmacology. Practical pharmacology, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Richards from the Society for General Microbiology. Um, in several places in your talk, you sort of mentioned that some of the issues related to not being enough discussion in society or a lack of public funding. Uh, to what extent do you think industry sort of needs to step up and maybe fund more basic research or blue sky science? Or well, take I a lead in, in leading these discussions? Yeah, I think industry funds a lot of blue sky science, always has actually. Um, and uh, I think there is... I mean, I don't think you can rely on industry to fund all that. I think it needs to be a public desire to want to be part of that system. And it slightly comes back to the point Mike raised. One of the interesting questions is, what percentage of the value created by the pharmaceutical industry is initially through public funding of science? And the answer is quite a lot. But that is the cost of getting to where you are. You can't, if you, if you get rid of that, you change the whole outlook of this, you make it much, much more expensive. So I think we all need to get over the fact that publicly funded science fundamentally forms the platform on which you can then invent medicines. And the UK is pretty good at it. And we need to keep that skill set up and we need to be prepared to fund public science. And we shouldn't get too upset if publicly funded science becomes a privately owned medicine. Okay, well, thank you very much, Patrick. I think that on that note, we really do need to draw this discussion to a close. So again, a very big thank you to you for a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Humphrey, for making such an excellent choice in the President's lecture, lecturer. And I'm going to hand back to Humphrey now for just one last little set of words. Stay put. Yeah. Well... Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thanks again to Patrick. I have one last duty, which is to uh, give Patrick the certificate of honorary fellowship of the British Pharmacological Society. It is the, uh, the highest honor that we offer to pharmacologists, and you more than deserve it. So thank you very much, Patrick.